Hi there, and welcome to the next episode of Future Roundnet Podcast. My name is Jakob Poplohar, and it is usually my job to deconstruct the habits and routine and success of very well accomplished people. In this case, an accomplished Roundnet player. My guest today is the flying Polishman, Janet Stakiewicz from Warsaw, Poland. Janek is a well-known name in the realms of Realmnet, especially since last year he and his partner Jarosław Chabala, as never called Realmnet, got fourth place at the European Championship in Padova, Italy. In this episode, we dive really into the depth of Realmnet, especially when it comes to mindset and mental tactics, because Janek's team is sometimes up and down, up and down. How does Yannick bounce back from failure or setbacks? What is the relationship between expectations and placing badly the tournaments? If you are a coach or an intermediate advanced player or even contender who's trying to improve and don't really know how and you feel stuck, this is really the episode for you. We've been working and studying psychology for quite some years and we share almost all of our knowledge in this episode. So we hope you're going to find a lot of value. Let us know in the comments. Well, without further ado, let's go enjoy Attack it. Future Round Net. Yana, welcome to the show. Hi, Jacob. Thanks for having me. I've been looking to this conversation for a long time now because we had shared so many different conversations over the course of years, we could say as probably one of the OGs, not only of the sport of Roundnet, original gangsters, but in many other things. But for people who don't know you yet, could you maybe introduce yourself a little bit? I mean, people are fully aware of your accomplishments on the court, but maybe who is Yannick as a person? Sure thing. So my name is Yannick Stajewicz. I'm from Warsaw, Poland, and a part of uh, Warsaw Spikes Roundnet Club, which recently has been growing a lot uh, thanks to our guys in Warsaw. Yannick, Max, and Mikolaj has been put in a ton of work and huge shout out to them for doing that. Uh, when it comes to my Roundnet career, I started playing around in 2017. Uh, if you don't mind, there's actually a great story behind that. So I okay. got to play two or three times uh, on a beach with my brother. One time, Friday night, I'm going out to a party and he catches me in the door. He says, tomorrow morning, 9 a.m., we're playing around the tournament or a spike ball tournament, he said. I'm like, great, what is spike ball? He was like, yeah, this ball trampoline we tried two, three or two times. I was like, okay, sure, but I'm still going to the party. Came back at five. He woke me up at eight. I was like, no freaking way. But somehow he got me out. We went, had a great time some losses some wins in a group stage and then we actually managed to win the lower bracket and to have the best time ever uh and yeah that was i got hooked from the very very beginning so i always love to tell that story because it's so funny that i had like three hours sleep before my first tournament when was this tournament and where it was in warsaw 2017 i believe it was june June in Warsaw, 2017. I mean, I was already aware of the sport since 2016, but this is, ladies and gentlemen, really old, old school round it. Most of the people just learned about it in 2019, 20 or later on, but it's been around actually kind of for a while, right? So that was your very first time as you came in contact with Spike Ball, as we all used to call it back then, right? Yes, sir. And how did your career went, like the early one from there? Because you're then rather young, pretty young. I mean, still in high school, if I remember correctly. And there's not really a competitive round, I think. There are not a lot of tournaments. So how did you pursue this career? Oh. Yeah, I was hooked from the very beginning. And I was a sport guy from uh, my very childhood. I've been playing football since I was a kid for like seven, eight years. And then I had a break from... I believe an age of 15 to 17 uh, with football. And uh, then I picked up around it and I, I'm super competitive. So I immediately started to look into find ways to get better 
and to beat my friends to be the best out of the group. And with that, uh, first tournament was in June 2017 in Warsaw, right? And I think in three months later, there was uh, uh, first European Championship in Belgium 2017, uh, which we decided to commit with my brother and be one of the four teams uh, representing Poland on that event. Being still super new to the scene and having like three way better teams uh, going with us. And we quickly realized that we have this unspoken dynamic and chemistry on the field with my brother that's uh, that you have with a partner that you've been playing for years with, which we kind of had with everything, but it beautifully translated to round it. So I went to Belgium uh, three months later, immediately got hooked on the community. I realized how much beautiful people uh, surround the round community and the, the game. And uh, yeah, since then, I was going to the uh, as many events in Warsaw, in Poland, and in Europe as I could. How did you do it, the very first European Championship 2017? Well, we had uh, a really good run. We managed to uh, finish actually top 10 all of the Polish teams, which was very nice. And wow. I believe our result was seventh place which was very surprising for us because we've honestly been playing for like three, four months. <laughs> so there was still the time of the game or of the sport where you can just pick it up, you're athletic, you know how to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you can be top eight Europe, which is nowadays, of course, not the case anymore. I mean, there are some hurdles you have to go through in order to get there. Obviously, qualify now for pro. We used to call it gold or premier in Europe. And obviously, that is the natural development of a sport. So, okay, so it was 2017, fairly new. 2018 was already a season, right? With a couple of Grand Slams. I think there was also one in Warsaw. Am I mm -hmm. getting correctly? Huh? Yes, I believe and, so. And what was your part in it? I mean, obviously, as a player, but with very lacking infrastructure, did you start to coach people with training session, coach yourself, or how did you proceed in the early days in order to get better? Because I remember when I started, there was not a lot of material around. Yeah, that's very true. I think the first material that you could actually get a lot of value from was how to round it from Preston. And before that, it was only game footage, which I loved to do uh, from the very beginning. So I would watch Drew Chizik channel which now is called i believe hdr plus uh which has a ton of game footage from back in the day uh kenny ortega ryan fitzgerald uh jared rouse legends of the game uh she's a show holder of course and uh, i just love to analyze and i think that's one of the things i'd love the people to get out of the podcast that game footage uh is actually one of the ways to truly get better watching your footage and the footage of the players that you want to play like and uh i think gives a ton of value and seeing yourself and others from the third person perspective uh you can learn a lot from that so i think that was a that was a huge thing back then besides all the training and pickups uh, that i did there are quite a few challenges though when it comes to watching your own footage or a different footage, right? I mean, first time, I will not forget this. I thought, oh, I would look so good on the camera when it comes around, playing like the American, and it is simply brutal. Yes, sir. It is brutal. And it's also one of the things that I encourage people to do when they ask about coaching tips. It's like, film yourself and be ready for a slaughter because you are not going to very likely enjoy what you're seeing but that is okay i mean we could do and we probably should do and people let us know in the comments more analysis of videos because what i found challenging earlier in my round career was okay what do i look for because i have or I, ha I had back then no idea right so you can be watching the videos and i i used to devour like devour i think is the right word i would watch everything on the richest channel 
But how was it for you back then and compared to now? Now, in terms of analyzing the footage, what were you looking for? Mm -hmm. And what changed, more or less? And now bear in mind that people are mostly listening to this, so we don't have mm -hmm. actual footage. So maybe just let's scratch the surface before we get into deep in footage analysis videos in specifically specific videos. Absolutely. Yeah. So I think back in the day, I was watching film a lot and I was just looking for the things that work. And I was trying to understand why Chizik Showalter and the best teams are the best, what makes them better. And uh, a huge thing uh, that the be best teams uh, had different with the other teams is the amount of mistakes, unforced errors that they did, uh, which is still to this day extremely important thing. Uh, so I was just trying to find ways, uh, look for the ways that uh, they, uh, why are they so so good and one why they play style work. And compared to nowadays, I feel like when I go into watching footage, I have I know what exactly I have in mind because I understand the game on uh, such a high level, uh, such a higher level than before. Uh, so I think I go much more into detail and uh, tracking every mistake, and I'm more looking into why something didn't work and how to fix it. So I try to recognize errors in my game, somebody else's game and find solutions, find solutions. Do you have a specific example that is easy to imagine for people watching or listening? Uh, yeah, sure. I I think uh, nowadays uh, Roundnet uh, is based on two main things when it comes to technical aspects, and it's a serve and serve receive. Obviously, as uh, Gabe Finocchi, one of the best players in the world, said, you have to have a set, a hit, and the serve receive dialed in. And when you have that fundamentals, you can work on your serve and defense because this is extra. But uh, we have to agree on that the on the fact that serve and serve receive is huge. So I love I love to watch footwork on serve receive and watch exactly what steps is the receiver doing and then why why did he get beaten? Why did he receive such a good serve correctly? Right? It's all in the footwork. And I think Paul Seymour is a great example in that. He gets aced very rarely because his, his footwork is, is flawless. So I think that's a great example. So guys, if you want to improve your service, receive, check out some footage from Eisentrager Seymour on and they also have an Instagram channel. So you can learn from, uh, obviously, Lucas as well. OK, so serve, receive is something that it's especially valuable for people on the high end level or the highest level. But mm -hmm. if I'm now, let's imagine I'm an intermediate player. I've just started playing. I played my part. I'm thinking maybe I've been already to tournament. I didn't do very well mm -hmm. result wise, but I had I had a great time. And now I want to analyze my footage. So I made a commitment. I'm going to film our pick up, my pickup game and I'm going to analyze it. What is the first thing that would strike? you or strike us as experienced round and coaches that this person let's call him I don't know, Jack, Jack should look look for, look out for? Um, well, that's a great question. I think what I would do in that uh, scenario and what I still does uh, is compare my footage with uh, great player footage. So like watch some pros from States or Europe and compare because then you're actually going to see the difference what you're doing uh, and what they're doing and uh, now you're going to see okay i'm moving during my set they don't i didn't know that actually changes uh, me setting better or me setting worse right so i should work on that my body mechanics during the serves are very different i'm losing a lot of power because of the body bad body mechanics Bad body mechanics, another thing, right? How they hit, how they receive. And I think that's finding those differences and realizing what they do that you don't or what they don't do that you do. 
uh, and fixing that, working on that is very valuable. I completely agree. And I would just elaborate on the fact that first look at your setting. I remember, I think, what was it, five, six years ago? I would compare my footage exactly. I would do exactly what you just said. But, and one of the learnings I got was like, wow, I said 90% of the time from over my head, from the top. And why does Chisek or Shower, they almost never do that? They would all do underhand setting. Now it is a common knowledge that around 80% of all the sets are from under. But there was a big eye opening for me, like, ah, oh, okay. So why are they doing it? Oh, well, if you do it from, like if you do the underhand set, you can still see the net, you can still see the defense and where your partner is. Whereas if you are going from the up, you may actually lose track of the net and everything is much more difficult, right? So this is one, one of the first things. Second, that I would like to point out is what you said, are you moving while doing the set? Right? Because a lot of people, they do the Dirk Nowitzki fadeaway or Kobe Bryant fadeaway also on the set. They, some of them lift their leg while yep. setting, are not very stable. They not, don't have the foundation. They don't plant their feet under the ball. And honestly, you cannot blame them because no one has ever taught, taught you. And there is a very little educational material for coaches, especially. Obviously, well, it's something that we're about to talk a little bit later on. So we see that we want to change it to us and our group, but you just try to do the best you can. But those would be the key takeaways. Okay. Film yourself and watch for the setting first. If you compare the footage from the, like from you and the European or American pros, whereas it can be tricky though, right? What do you feel about the highlight videos? Because till recently there was the only footage or only videos that you could get, right? Were the highlights. Yeah. That's Are true. highlights videos good to learn from? Uh, that's a great question. I think, and to some degree, yes, because uh, you can just, let's say you want to sell, serve like Clapper, right? Best server in the world, potentially. From Ohio, two meter lefty. <laughs> crazy, crazy guy, crazy serves. Uh, one of the best players in the world. And uh, yeah, so basically you watch a highlight of uh, Kingdom Come, you slow down the video to point, uh, 0.25 on YouTube and you go frame by frame analyzing his form. So you see exactly how does he uh, perform the surf and his battle mechanics. So in that regard, definitely you can find a lot of value in the highlights. But I feel like highlights are uh, like an Instagram photo filtered with a thousand filters. You know what I mean? You see this and then you're like, oh, I, I go to pick up next time. I'm going to go. It's going to go exactly like that. And it doesn't because the highlights doesn't, don't show what actually happened. A ton of mistakes that they did and everything. Right. So don't get the wrong idea of uh, just thinking that those teams that are really good have only games like that. It's it's not like that. But I think you can uh, take away a lot of good value from a highlight video. What do you think? Do you think highlights are good or would you rather learn from whole games? That is difficult. I would say it comes down to my goals as a person who's trying to improve. Because in the highlights videos, it is, as you said, it's a highlight reel. So the best serves, the best says, the best hits are going to be there. And for me, what was very difficult to grasp at the beginning of my career, before I had a chance to play a lot in the US, I was like, okay, they never made mistakes. So I suck, I cannot keep up. But then I was there and they overset, they double fold a lot. Like also premier players, because... I mean, we can maybe get into this later, the difference between my very first premier tournament in my mindset and then the second premier tournament in the US, or the second trip actually, because my mindset had completely changed because I thought, oh, these people, they make super highlight videos. They're almost flawless. So I kind of beat myself before going to the game, but it's already the level that you get to play against them. 
But in a highlight video, a lot of things that people don't see is there are a lot of things that went wrongly in that play. Meaning, if you get a great defensive touch, usually the set is a little bit off. Mm -hmm. And it is very rarely, and I think very rarely, that there's an amazing play because offense did everything right and also defense. And there's a lot of luck involved. So in terms of entertainment, great value. In terms of um, like sports exposure mm -hmm. for social media, very mm -hmm. good. But bear in mind, it is called a highlight reel for a reason. Right, mm -hmm. and maybe you see there's a game that had a lot of highlights. So, and you have the possibility of watching or finding the raw footage somewhere. Mm -hmm. And sure, go for it. But even for me, and I would consider myself around it enthusiast to say the least, it is very tough to go and watch entire games in raw form. Even my games, so even more challenging to do some someone else's games if you don't have scoreboard. And all of this stuff, right? So that can be very, very yeah, frustrating at the time. Mm -hmm. If you have a goal in the mind, okay, I want to watch and look at these players or my videos and then maybe do stats, but it is now getting very technical. And you can definitely find the value. But I see highlight was more as an entertainment value with the, okay, this is not real. This does not happen that often, but it's really cool. So let's go. But I don't watch highlight videos. I would say first. Really? Dude, you have to watch the Moneyball highlight of it. No, no Moneyball. What am I saying? The uh, money line right there and Matt Call. Uh, okay, you watch that one? The that one? Yeah. Good serves, but also like a great story with the the mold, the ball that they played with. Uh, that's also a very funny thing uh, that I, I want to touch on. Uh, that I, I had. Uh, some experiences when I played a, a tournament match with somebody else's ball. And I think it gives such a huge advantage that recently in Prague, uh, I played a game against the Italians in group with their ball. And they started like 3 0, I believe, with like insane serves. And I'm like, can I call it now? It, it felt bad to call it like after playing three points. So I decided to let it go. But then we met uh, later uh, in that tournament and I was like, hey, how about playing with two like organizers balls? Not mine, because I also had mine, not yours, universal balls. And I think it's uh, such a funny thing because in a professional sport like tennis or basketball, you couldn't get your ball that you scored a thousand, ten thousand shots with. You have to play with a universal one. But uh, Right now, with rounded growing sport, there's still some uh, some gray areas like the having your own ball at the tournament, which I still recommend because it's gonna get banned very soon, I believe, and it's still nice to play with your ball. I believe rounded Germany or the front forerunner in organizing rounded has made the rule that both parties, both teams, need to agree on the balls before the game mm. and it is a situation i mean this is a different topic so the seventh comes that a lot of balls that we play on tournament from certain manufacturer certainly don't have the quality of a proper ball the balls from a couple of years ago which is sad and the equipment needs to be standardized so this is another step of making run a legitimate sport because this simply cannot happen and it yeah. is very difficult also for tournament directors. I mean, I ran a lot of events, of round and events as well, that you need to go and tell the players, okay, you are not supposed to play with your ball. You cannot. Because yeah. Yeah, that is more role of a tournament director, which in a lot of cases is an unpaid role or someone does it just for the love of the sport. They don't want to be the bad guy. Mm -hmm. But you need to be. And unless... It's easier to be a bad guy if you're getting paid at least a little bit for it. I mean, I talk extensively about this stuff with Ruben Schröder. However, in German, but you can use the YouTube automatics captions that actually translate into a lot of languages to get in touch with that. But yeah, I mean, it is fun that you mentioned because it's very unaware to most people. 
but yes, we do feel the difference. I mean, yeah. I, I have a great Kobe Bryant story that I've heard once. Kobe Bryant, the late Kobe Bryant, one of the legends of all the sports. Right? He was warming up before a game and something was off and he couldn't really point out what it was. And then he figured the bar was too low, so the hoop. And he went to the organizers and said, okay, your hoop is too low. Uh, no. They were like, no, 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 it's not. I was like, no, it is too low, measure it. And they indeed measure it and it was lower by a couple of centimeters. No way. Yeah, so he figured out just from his shot. So imagine the level of expertise you have to have. That's that you know that the hoop is lower by a couple of centimeters. That's crazy. I've never heard the story. This would be an anecdote to the very good ball when it comes in terms of round and, yeah. and the level that some some of us, you could say, already play this amateur sport on the highest professional level, not in terms of finance, mm -hmm. but in terms of preparing ourselves for the yeah. season. And maybe we could go into that before we analyze your 23 season, you and your partner, your so Chabala, team never called. Shout out to Yaro. Do you, shout out to Mr. Yaro. How do you prepare or do you plan your season? So now we're already slowly getting into 2024. First tournaments are underway. The first sanctioned events from European Round of Association Riga took place. Now we have come Mallorca is upcoming ETS Barcelona. before last season for i believe two or three seasons i was a free shooter in a way i was playing a ton of high level tournaments with uh different partners different different partners uh every time maybe a little bit about that because i think you can have great value from both mm -hmm. uh playing with different partners you learn a ton because you have to uh be able to adjust to their gameplay and then you also learn a lot from the person uh you're playing with you also make great friends on, along the way uh but playing with a fixed partner enables you to go in depth into tactics and really becoming the one being one on the field which is also like extremely important in the highest uh, highest on the highest level so yeah, it started uh, after last season ended. And then preparation uh, after Padua, I believe, uh, was figuring out how long is the off season. So I know Mallorca would be a first big event of the season. It's not a Grand Slam, Barcelona is, but Mallorca, there will be uh, players, the best players from Europe and States. So I would okay, Yes. Oh, yeah. That's true. All over the world. Uh, all over the world. So I picked uh, Mallorca as a as a date of the season starting, and I uh, just planned out what I want to get better at in terms of my game. And when I say that, I'm not only talking of, about five aspects of the technical pillar of the sport, but uh, like all four pillars. That is like technical, which in includes serve serve receive defense hitting and setting then after technical you have the physical so agility speed plyometrics but also strength and injury prevention and then two more would be tactics and mental and uh, this off season i changed my preparation from the last seasons and i went in depth with the mental preparation which i think gave me the most uh, improvement 
since a long time because it enabled me to play my best at tournaments and to be my best at the, at the trainings and to understand my what I'm feeling during tournaments and so much more and to that also gave me tools to handle pressure uh in the tournaments so I think people tend to forget or not people tend to forget but we've uh we put it in a way uh creating content and highlights that it's all about serves or all about defense or all about the technical aspects right but in the professional sport uh you have to have all four dialed in to be uh, a complete player so you don't you not only focus on the tech technical you focus on your body mechanics your physical approach as well as tactics and uh, mental approach which uh, Casti Amaro uh, Mike Tyson's coach uh, said it's mental is 90 percent of the sport it just it is really huge and I think it gets overlooked a lot of times and I think uh, we should uh, make people more aware of the fact that it's not only technical but there are four pillars to the sport i completely agree but and i think this needs to be elaborated and we can stay and stay here for a long time because i believe we we need to and people should know because it is it is quite challenging as you said it's not that you would ignore the mental preparation on purpose but there are multiple steps so first and foremost in order to to make it more transparent we're all talking about now higher level sports if you don't know how to set the ball in round net or how to, how to hit the ball like completely or in any other sport let's say in basketball you don't know how to do a layup then you can have the best mental preparation in the world you're not going to be successful in terms of results i mean you need to do the work you need to do the fundamentals and the preparation right that is what you usually do get in your sports clubs if you play football if you play tennis you have a coach, you have teammates, and you start doing this together from very early age. That is not the case in Roundit. And Roundit is unique in this scenario because a lot of people start playing when they're 22, 25. Some of them played sports before, but some of them did not. And in terms of coaching, I've coached hundreds of people, especially in Munich, where I started my Roundit journey. And I had someone who could not literally catch the ball. Couldn't literally catch the ball. First sport ever. Very unsporty person. I don't have anyone specific in my case. But you, you see you see the patterns. Yeah. So yeah. that is, again, diff different conversation. We return to that as if you are a starting player or starting athlete. But for already more established athletes, it is extremely vital. And what I want to point out is the drone is very, very challenging in this regard because until, I don't want to say recently, but what I know, there may be 10 coaches, like rounded coaches in the world. So I mean, there are a lot of people who coach around and try to do the best or PE teachers, mm -hmm. right? But there are very few people who play it on the high level. And I'm not saying you have to be the best player in order to be the best coach. Absolutely not. But you should have certain level of expertise so you can identify the problem so you can to relate to your players, especially in a new sport, and then focus more on coaching and teaching them. Because a lot of this mental coaching starts subconsciously. You're not aware as a kid that your coach is training you mentally. No. You know, and maybe to give you an example to all of you is suicide sprint so suicide sprint is especially known from the movie coach carter uh, one of my favorite movies of all times because it's not only about basketball but it's about education and actually education being more important than a sport is that you sprint to a line then the second line to so let's say three point line then half half court line and you just go and you're training the I know, I know in Slovak and German. So you're training the speed endurance, forgive mm -hmm. me for the term. But that training is not very efficient at the end. So if you already was sprint training before or stamina training, so let's say you ran 
five kilometers beforehand, then it does not really make a lot of sense or you had a session in the waiting room. But what it teaches us, and I remember this very vividly from playing floorball on the highest levels of indoor hockey in Czech Republic, that even though we couldn't go and your muscles hurt and the training is not on the first place, like first priority, it teaches you to push through pain. And that is the mental aspect that you go through pain. You feel like you're going to throw up. And some of people do throw up through the training center, but you keep pushing. Because as an, an, any elite athlete will tell you, you need to learn how to love the pain because you'll be in pain all the time. If you're playing sports on the highest level, which is something that I don't believe a lot of people in Groundnet want to do. It's more about socializing and having a good time and doing something with your body. But this is what the good coach does over a longer period of time. Because I believe what we do in Roundnet a lot, or the mindset that needs to change a little bit, is that we only plan for next year, or maybe even okay, for next tournament, or next week, or next month. That's why I asked you about your season preparation. Because, okay, so this year, but then what about the year after? And the year after that, how long do you want to keep playing? How many tournaments do you want to be playing? How yeah. do you analyze all the things that happened that year? Because if you just go from tournament to tournament, as we used to do, I think, especially in 2022, almost we saw each other almost every weekend all across Europe at yeah. a lot of tournaments. Then what is your long term plan? Because you cannot win everything first year, right? But That's you can good. win the unbeatable in three, four years if you put in the work gradually across, across the stem with developing, with a coach, with having a vision, with having a structure, especially because you cannot win every tournament. Yeah, that's that's very true. I just want to touch on what you said about uh, mental preparation and uh, being comfortable, being uncomfortable. Uh, like Mike Tyson said it very well, that you do what you hate to do, but do it like you love it. You know, and I feel like you're very right that in Roundup, we don't, uh, not a lot of people, if any, honestly, go to, uh, go the distance, go to that lens uh, of pushing themselves. Uh, if maybe, maybe I'm wrong, maybe there's a ton of people grinding out there. Uh, obviously, serve wise, there's plenty, right? But we're talking about, uh, a full full training from every uh, aspect and for those huge shadow because putting the work i know from experience it's very hard especially if you're pushing yourselves to the limits but that's when we're talking about somebody being uh, or they don't even have to be good but they're striving to be to be better and to be great actually right so that's what you need to do if you're your plans and your vision is to go the distance and to accomplish great things and in, in the sport of running. But touching on the uh, previous point of our conversation, when we talked about somebody who ju is just starting is a beginner in the intermediate or, or advanced, I feel like the, be the best uh, focus point in the training for that person would be two things. Uh, which one touches on the technical aspect and the second on the physical. Like, like you said, you have to have those two dialed in before you go into the uh, tactics and mental in-depth. And uh, I would say technical is ball control, or as I like to call it, the touch, which uh, you just uh, uh, figure out and practice by playing with the ball whichever way you please. It's honestly no wrong answers and you just set the ball hand to hand only right only left you maybe juggle it with your feet if you're a, a footballer or you play football so you uh, get to know how the ball works and with that you you're able to control the ball a lot better and then you'll see that uh, setting hitting and every part of the game in terms of the technical aspect improves with that so that would be the first and the second i would say the footwork you have to analyze and figure out how you move and what what, what can you be do better and add just a little one 
Um, if you're training once a week, twice a week, once a month, doesn't matter. Uh, just add one training to your schedule with some agility and plyometrics. And then you'll see that you'll be able to move quicker and to uh, be better in defense, but also same goes with footwork in terms of hitting, footwork in terms of setting and everything else. So I think those two things would be keys for people that honestly from all the levels, but definitely beginners and intermediate advanced players who want to get better, uh, I would recommend for them, for you to train those things first. You see, and this is, for example, where our opinions slightly differ. I believe the mental thing, like the mental game, and okay, again, we need to specify mental game. So I'm not talking about being a close game, 19, 20 year down one, what kind of serve you do, and so on and so forth. I'm talking more about how do you approach training? What is the mindset? Mm -hmm. Because the sure. challenge is it does not usually come from the coach. In round, from my experience, there may be a lot of coaches out there, then please reach out to us and we can have a discussion. That it doesn't really happen because you go to training session. If you already do, let's say you sign up for a club, you're in Germany, Switzerland, friend, friends, and you go to your club, but every training is usually only a single ion. And a lot of the times the structure, the vision from the coach is missing or of the club because they haven't set goals or what do we want to train with these people? Are we taking new people on board every single time, especially in the summer when there's plenty of space where you can practice at home? It gets more tricky in winter with, with limited spaces. But mm -hmm. if I go into a new group, first thing I'm going to do with them is obviously ask about the goals, but tell them, okay, this is what we are going to do. We are in here for a, sh a long run, meaning we will not do serving today, tomorrow, the day after tomorrow, we'll do serving, but we need to build up to that mm. with time and you need to trust the process, which is very difficult if your coach is someone else every single week, right? And if your players are different every single week mm. and then you have different skill levels. So those are the, 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 that is the foundation that the people in charge of clubs or national governing bodies or even the European Union Federation need to give, hand out some kind of guidelines, okay, how to make the sport, because some coaches or clubs do it um, from the intuition, because yeah. they did it in different sports. Mm -hmm. But a lot of them, they just want to play, and then there's no one to lead the training. So, okay, I'll give training, but really, I want to be a player. Mm -hmm. This actually happened to me in one club recently when they were talking, okay, 15 or 16 players, I was like, okay, 16 players plus the coach. No, the coach is number 16. I was like, mm -hmm. okay, but how can coach be number 16 if he's coaching? I mean, yes, he also wants to be part of the exercise because he wants to coach for himself and trade for himself. But then I, I said, okay, do you see the conflict? I understand and we'll do it your way, of course. But if I'm leading a training session, I mean, I learned the hard way, the same way with, if I'm running a tournament, I shouldn't play in it, especially up from certain number of teams yes is i'm there to coach if i get to play perfect but i'm there to coach and make sure that everyone else improves yeah how did, how did you do it in warsaw because in warsaw spike you were one of the first ones uh to start to start coaching so do you guys have some structures in place there or still trying to figure things out because it's okay to try to figure things out because this has never been done before no oh, absolutely uh, yeah, so I started coaching in 2020, uh, which at the very beginning was just uh, trying to explain my understanding of the game to some friends. And I think that was my first uh, coaching or approaching approaches to coaching. Uh, and then over time, I started doing clinics uh, in Poland and in Europe. Uh, and now in Warsaw Spikes, we have, uh, uh, have a training every week, which is uh, run by, uh, by one coach. 
uh, recently it has been Max and uh, again shout out to him he's been doing a great great job uh, when while coaching and we have an hour of uh, drills and an hour of pickup so it's a good mix of the, of the two which obviously we start with warm up drills pickup and some uh, cool down and uh, yeah I think it's uh, really important for a coach like you said to coach and be there to coach only uh after pickup we do play together uh and that's something that we might think about if we actually want the coaches to play in the pickup that much or if they actually want to go look around and give some advice to people because one thing is doing an exercise in the drill but the other thing is uh executing it in a game and then when you really can give somebody uh, real feedback on how they are doing and how they can improve uh but yeah this is how we ran it we also have a smaller group uh, of the more advanced players that we meet which is also i think very valuable and if, if you have a resources in your club i would uh, highly recommend to split the group uh if you also have a space uh, and personalized training for uh more advanced players and more beginners play more beginner players uh, because that enables you to give more value to both if you don't have that option uh then i would suggest to always include an easier and a harder variation when explaining the drill right you want to explain the drill very simple very easily understandable and then always give one easy how to make it easier for the beginners and how to make it harder for the most more advanced so people like are like okay this is easy i can do this this is too hard i can do this while doing the drill and that's what i would recommend for the coaches and yeah if uh, if you're running a club or you're a coach what i would like to highlight from the things that you have just said is that the coach is an external force but also external guide so to say and what we see also i mean we ran clinics together and was talk about what are our plans for 2024 in terms of clinics because last year we did quite a few plus obviously my RFA training week is that for example the last clinic that i did in riga latvia just give you if i give you if you're one of the participants and i give you just one tip let's say i see that your elbow is always dropping before you your head and you just cannot figure out okay what's happening why you can't you know, get the shot you really want to come and say okay watch your elbow then i literally lift the person's elbow sometimes because they don't know how to feel it they don't know how to feel it. they go through the motions and in 10 seconds, I saved someone weeks or months of work, right? Yeah, of facts. They may be practicing, they're practicing a lot that they just don't understand why they cannot get results, why they are still stuck in contender advanced, because they may be doing the same mistake over and over and over again. And this is where a coach who has seen a lot or in a way seen it all in this very young sport, which is very complex. Mm -hmm. uh, not to joke ourselves about that. Is it okay? What's your elbow? Okay, where do you look when you hit? And things you can use straight away. So, sure, in 90 minutes or 120 minutes, if you come to the clinic, you may not sweat a lot. You may not get 60 minute personal attention one to one with the coach. But it's one single tip. Only 20 seconds can give you or will give you probably the map value for money times 10 because you just said yeah, so, right. so, so this is the big aspect where the coaching comes in because in our sport there's been as i said but there is very little coaching right? because almost everyone wants to play and they become coaches because they want to play and improve so it's interesting how, how you solved it uh, in Warsaw and I.
what I include. And um, then I figured out every exercise, every drill that I want to include. What do I want to talk about? And what do I want to touch on in terms of all the four pillars? And to be honest, that's uh, something that maybe very little people know about, but I've never been this stressed and anxious before around that event, which wasn't even a tournament. Like after the clinic and before the tournament, the day after the clinic, I was chilling. I was so like it was European Championship. It's you know the whole build, the whole season is building up to that point, to that final tournament, and I'm I'm so chill. But before the clinic, I was so anxious. Because it was, I think, the biggest clinic that I ran. I ran it uh, not single single handedly because I had the great help from Yaro, Kuba, Max. Shout out to them. But all the content, all the value, I uh, prepared and provided uh, myself on my own. So with some good hints uh, from Yago and uh, from yes, Kuba and Yaro again. Uh, so. The whole clinic, I believe, lasted over three hours. It was a really, really long clinic. And uh, I I had some great feed, feedback after the clinic. Uh, uh, also, I had some good tips on how to improve, uh, what to do and what not to do. Uh, and I believed we touched on all the five aspects of technical. Uh, walk, I started with walking through the theory. Uh, and then doing some drills, giving out tips. And then when Kuba, Yaro came in handy very much because we were all on the field going from net to net and giving feedback to people, which I believe is super valuable. And as you said, can really have a tremendous impact on somebody, somebody's improvement, somebody's growth. Uh, and then after technical, we touched on the tactical aspects how I approach it, what are the main things about it, uh, the mental and some physical physical exercises that are my favorite and how I like to train. So I wanted to really give the people the idea of the fact that it's not only technical, it's the four pillars, like I mentioned previously in the uh, in our conversation. So yeah, that was that was that was the clinic. It was Crazy good. I was very happy after it and I'd love to do it again someday. Yeah, you also didn't do very badly at the tournament the following day, finishing fourth in Europe in the LA division with Piero. Yeah. But what I what I love about now what you just said, share because I didn't know. I mean, we talked in preparations because I was doing the backstage work with setting everything up, making sure we had the facility working with the Italians, that we had the promotion, because there's much more to a clinic, it may look just two hours or three hours, than people realize. And I just love the fact that you said you were so nervous and stressed out because it is okay to be nervous. You're standing in front of people you do not know, they have expectations, they paid money. So they're expecting something in return, they're expecting a lot in return, and you want to over deliver, you don't want to disappoint them. and I believe this is a lot what happens also with a lot of coaches because not everyone has a coaching background, for example, like myself. I'm from coaching and teaching family. So for me, it comes very naturally. I feel like fish in the water in front of a group. I love it. Right? But also what people don't realize is that there are huge differences between holding a clinic, having a training week that I want to ask you about, uh, that you did or we did in Mallorca last year and it's upcoming as well and working long term mm. with certain groups of players mm. right so what are the differences for you for example if you compare okay one time event you have more time with the peoples and and then you imagine because this is a situation that is not very common you'd have six months or a year with a certain group that's yeah, that's great. That's that's a great question. I think uh, what I would look for in a clinic is understand what the people want. And the easiest thing is just to have a survey before a clinic 
and then ask people what do they want to improve what do they want to hear about what do they want to what do they want to learn and you can guess and you can think okay i know what do i want to tell them but they're there you're there to make them happy so just understand what's important to them and uh, provide on that and yeah on during actually a clinic in padua at the at the end i tried to touch on every question uh, obviously there were a lot of questions about things that uh, repeated but uh, touch on everything to make the people feel understood and feel heard and then provide them value with the exact questions that they ask so in terms of cleaning i would focus on that also figure out a plan what do you want to deliver because a clinic that i did in Padua was super long because of the content that i wanted to give but usually you don't have that much time so i would recommend to pick a thing that you really want to uh, elaborate on because if you want to elaborate on something it will take honestly three and a half four hours if you want to elaborate on every aspect of the game so that's it when it comes to a clinic um if you have a week with some uh with a group which is honestly a great experience especially if you don't know the group if you do it's still a great experience i had both with uh polish round national team as well as mallorca with some top notch european players uh, a week is a longer period right so you can really touch and elaborate on all the aspects but also this is the thing in a week's training that's cannot be found in the clinic that you have a lot of time with the people you get to know them you get to know how they play you get to know what do they do right and what they what do they do wrong so you can give them a ton of feedback a really truly personal personalized feedback that will enhance their game hugely so i think feedback in terms of uh, a week's training is a huge thing obviously the content and the value that you want to provide but uh, getting to know the people and giving personalized feedback is always always huge and then lastly when it comes to a longer period of time which i've been doing for over three months i believe four months uh with uh, my guys in warsaw that uh, uh the, the advanced players we approach it do it that way that we want to set goals and plan our work execute and then review and adjust so it's a four four step formula you plan you execute you review and you adjust so we plan for what we want to achieve in terms of our growth we execute every two weeks every month we review how we're doing on that and then again personalized feedback but we also can see how were we doing a month ago compared to how we're doing now what gotten better but what we're still stuck at right so then you review your work you adjust your plan and you execute more and you repeat the process so that would be my approach to all those three uh uh things right yeah because at the end of the day especially i mean we can return to let's say to the clinic because I don't even know how many clinics I held, to be honest, uh, and training sessions I, I've lost count uh, over the years, is that we do indeed sell, send out a survey because we need to understand the needs of the clinic. And this is what differentiates us from competition. I mean, there's not really a competition, I would say, because it's still very new and the cake is, or the pie is big enough for, for all of us. The more coaches are there doing clinics, the better, the more events they organize, because then they actually get to see the differences in approach and quality. But is that we sent out a survey, for example, before Göteborg Clinic or Vienna or in Riga recently, and we get feedback from people. And then you evaluate, and this is all the pre-preparation, or this is the preparation where 
we as the coaches meet and evaluate, okay, this is what people want. This is what they think they need because there are questions in the questionnaire or in the form on purpose formulate. I mean, I study psychology and business that is not a coincidence, the questions, right? Um, so, and then what we feel like is where you get the greatest benefits. And then to find the, the balance is really the art. And I don't think I, I or you or Kuba find the balance every single time 100%. Absolutely not. We are also just immense and we are learning. And we are dependent on the feedback from you guys also when it comes to this podcast. Okay, what do you like? What did you like? What you hated? What was really bad? What was really good? So then we can adjust. But it is much more challenging to adjust on the go within an hour or two, because I believe you're very familiar with the school because apparently it's one of your role models, Mike Tyson's coach. Everyone has a great plan until they get punched in the face. Yes, sir. And that happened to me you know, in Riga a couple of weeks ago because with a great facility around it, Latvia, Alex and his entire team did a great job. So I could really just come and coach, which is the dream, which is where we have the biggest failure. And we want to do this continually throughout Europe or actually the world, so to say. But there was a floorball game going on in the next gym straight next to us, which was just divided by paper wall. Mm. So you could hear all the music, all the shouting. So I could not speak most of the times. And then it was much more challenging. So I had to adjust on the go. Luckily, I had years of experience, so I don't think it was such a big deal. But this is what a good coach should do because I had a great plan. I sent out the instruction videos beforehand with the coaching, and this is what we're going to do according to your feedback. And I came there. I was like, okay, first, a couple of different groups that I expected or that said something before, and also super loud, and I cannot talk. So, okay, what do you do? What I do, maybe tips for, for coaches or all the teachers, I think the teachers now, you just do a drinking break, get some water. Then you buy yourself one minute of time or two minutes to really go quickly, like, okay, okay, and you're just like reloading, rerouting, rerouting in your brain. Okay, <laughs> okay, next. So water break, next time you're in my clinic and you'll hear me water break. If there's a second water break in five minutes, Right. Right. In the case, but you know, you clinic. Okay, water break, everybody. Yeah, water break. <laughs> Hello, my name is Jakub Poblar, and let's have a water break. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so that, that would be that would be a classic. But th this is the thing that we try to get as much as intel for people. And if you have, if other coaches are listening, do it. I mean, just reach out to us. We actually may send you the form. Um, so you can get inspiration, so we can all improve, because I believe, and I think both of us, the, or the entire future on organization, we want the world to improve, because that means more people will be playing the game, meaning more money could flow in, there's more interest, and we, or you guys as players, uh, grow more, me as a coach, because then the pie gets even bigger, right? And we can spread so much more joy to more people, and motivate them to move, maybe have a healthier lifestyle, improve their relationship, their social connections, and so on and so forth. So that, that, is, that is the big difference why we're actually putting this out for free, whereas people do study this or charge all of money in different businesses. But I think we all just care and want to see the sport grow. Very true, very true. So. When we talk about the said <coughs> you said sorry, that you had a week of coaching Mallorca, what did we learn as coaches from last year? Because I also coached, but I was more obviously a different role um, towards this year. So what can be people looking forward to this year compared to last year? Hmm. Right. What did we learn last year? Uh, I think since it was uh, first big event of this magnitude this size uh, we had the chance to 
try have trial and error with a lot of things even though we did clinics in the past that was the for many of us probably coaches uh me included the biggest uh event in terms of coaching around that that i had and i think i learned great many things uh which uh first of all nothing or not not nothing scratch that uh the plan that you have doesn't go according to plan as you said everybody has a plan like, until they get punched in the face so you have to be able as a coach to uh, be, be flexible adjust and uh, have a plan but also have that uh, room to improvise and to adjust your plan according to the uh, mm, to the situation you're, you're given because we had that thing with uh, training i believe on uh, one of the days it was pouring rain terribly yeah. and we were like Still. we had a, we had a, it was it was a huge storm and we we're like we should have a training right now what do we do and then we came up with uh four stations that all the groups went which one was footage review second was uh reaction time test and some community and group uh binding uh exercises and i think that was that was a really good uh thing from my article last year that i would love to include as well uh, having obviously the training sessions, but also touching on uh, some aspects like take, like mental tactics, which can be done inside uh, somebody given a, a, a clinic or a speech on that. Uh, yeah, so I think that would be the thing that struck, struck me the most. What do you think? What do you think we learned and can change and can do better this year for Mallorca? Mm -hmm. So I agree with what you said that the weather did punch us in the face, being very cold and very rainy. Luckily, at our facility, we had the opportunity to build multiple stations for a significant amount of people and as you said this has never been really done before in the round of the world that you would have such a long time with certain group mm -hmm. and with a lot of people who improve greatly one of the challenges that we had was how do we split the groups according mm -hmm. to the levels because with having four coaches this year we're going to have five coaches uh, as you already know from our instagram so the groups are actually even smaller the level does play a big difference because you plan or you can do different things if you everyone knows everyone's high skill or is on the same level no doubt about that so we actually changed that because it was very difficult subjectively to put people in the groups according to the level especially with the weather being bad and it was a lot of rain it was cold you know you may not serve as well you are nervous, you're being judged. And this, I think, was uh, new for a lot of people that they were being judged. We were there literally standing for paper with our forms as scouts. And actually, I think we all enjoyed the experience kind of because like, okay, I we think that was very funny. Yeah, we felt important. Someone should have taken a picture. You know, yeah. like, okay, what do you think? This and that. You know, like <laughs> they teach you all about don't judge other people, get to know them better. Whereas, you know, don't judge book by its cover. But it was our job in that scenario to judge. We're the judges. We're okay. And this goes there and there, you know. I felt like yeah. um, it's called a training pad from Harry Potter. You know, you go there and then, then you get the group, like, please not to slither in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Did I see a double fall? Okay. Asterix <laughs> next to this name. Double yeah, pass. pretty much. And I don't know. Or a very stupid hit, but it was fun. Okay. No. So this was one thing that we changed. And we actually asked people in advance, is it going to be one-to-one, -one, their groups according to what they said? No. It's guidelines. And we're also still going to adjust because what we have in Rawnet a lot is it's very difficult to sort yourself or put yourself in perspective compared to our players. Especially, let's say, in Mallorca, 
where we have the best players in the world, you can say, and especially Europe, we have Laura, we have the European champions. Then who do you compare yourself to? Okay, you're not on the level, but you're the best in your country. Okay, is your country Germany with a lot of great players? Or is the country some that has 20 players? Or is it Slovakia? Let's put it that way. Yeah. So you don't need a lot to be the best in Slovakia. Actually, that's not very true. But uh, as an example to demonstrate the point. Because also when it comes to divisions, advanced contender, for example, during my time at the European Run Association, I made this guideline that you should be able to play contender only if you played at least in 10 tournaments and you place on a podium. So local tournaments without divisions. Because that's contender should be for those people, in my view, who aspire to become pro or be in the division where not everyone can go straight away. Right? So yeah, we ask people, we'll see how it goes, how we'll adjust. And for me, it was like 23, heartbreaking in a way that I wanted to coach so much because it's what I love doing. But I realized that I would give more value if I coached you guys and make sure, okay, the training sessions are on point. We have the exercise, we have the topics. And what I loved about this year that we've met more times, the coaches now, and came up with a plan together. So it was not me saying, okay, well, let's do this, this, and this, but it's our common vision because I don't have all the answers and I love to learn from different sports, from different people. So I think this is the biggest difference and we'll just have to see how, how it plays out, how our people participating in fresh, especially in wing one, what kind of feedback they're going to give us, but you're in for a ride because we also have some new things coming and I'm very excited. But the most exciting what I was was that we managed to make this the very first type of event in the sport. Because I knew it from handball, I knew it from floorball. But to do it in round it and that being able to be one of the people doing that uh, myself was a it was a great privilege. It was a lot of hard work, a lot of weeks. I don't want to get into the preparation. It takes weeks or months to create such event. But that, that was it for me. Then, you know, when it comes, um, okay, when it comes to Mallorca, it's already 24, but maybe let's go quickly back, Yannick, to 23 to the season, because it had quite a, I would say, a successful season for sure, but also you had your ups and downs. Oh, for sure. And let's explore more the mental side of the thing. So people who are listening can also apply it to their game, but also to their life. Because the mental side, you're going to get knocked down as Rocky Balboa said, yes, over sister alone. A lot of times it's not about how hard you can hit. It's about how hard you can get hit and still keep on going forward. And obviously you knew I had to ask. You started season Verna Open in Czech Republic. <laughs> Never called one of the favorites for the win at the tournament. Uh, other men mentionable teams, Nelson and Rafi from Austria, mm. winners, Kuba Vishek and Connor Prelli, American US Premier player, and myself and Benny the Batch, Batch Bachla, the European champion. And we did meet in the semifinals. Benny, mm. without playing a couple of months, I did not touch a ball in three months, I believe. Uh, at that stage, somehow made it to the semis, and then we are in game three against Yuan Yar. And yeah, it was a crazy roller coaster game. Honestly, uh, it was a uh, it was a good, very good tournament, uh, well organized as every tournament that Dominic from uh, Czech Republic does. Huge shout out to Dominic, as well as the trash camps. But speaking of Berno, we met in the semis. You play with the uh, with Benny, the water bear. <laughs> uh, and it was a, a crazy game because I believe we won the first set 21-10 uh, with really, really clean put uh serves, setting, everything went our way. Uh, so it was a very, very good first set from us. Then you bounced back. We had an equal game, and I believe the game ended 
21 or something like that uh, when you won the second set, Benny uh, finished finished it with a drop serve ace on me. Uh, but I, I believe that in this game, we just made a couple mistakes. And if we don't make them in the third set, we are sure to go into the finals. And then, and then yeah, we did we, play clean, and then we did play clean the first half of the game, and then it's 13-7, uh, it's 15-8, 16-9. And at, at that point, 16-9, I did something that you guys listening should never, ever do in a game, which is believe you have won the game before it has finished. Because at that point, 16-9, I did not believe the situation that we were going to lose this game i was 100 percent sure that we we're winning this game and then you out of nowhere came back and i remember you telling me this you said you went to benny you said benny i'm going all in i don't care let's go benny is like i'm with you brother you pulled three aces in a row on us crazy spinning backhand and then you forced our mistakes and you played very clean, but you went into my head uh, that I made three mistakes after that. And I believe then the score was 18, 17. So uh, you scored six, we scored two. So eight yeah. points, we only yeah. two, right? That's, that cannot happen. So that was a great performance from you, poor performance from me, but because of the mistake that I did, I believe that we have won. And then you came back and then it was in my head and then you went on to winning that semifinal. Uh, and uh, yeah, that's a very a good lesson learned and learned the hard way. But I I think it you always should look at things that way, that it stings in a moment. The more it stings, it's the better, the better the lesson, the more you're going to learn, the harder you're going to remember it. Because from then on, I've never uh, had that mentality ever again. Like 17, 10 games with Yaro, I'm go I'm talking to Yaro, Yaro, we need more. Never enough. If we are here to win 21-0, we are here to win 21-0. I'm not talking playing with, uh, with beginners in the pickup tournament play, right? So that was the story of the infamous sem semi-final of Bernal Open. And speaking of uh, 2023 seasons, ups and downs most definitely. It started with huge preparation from us. Yeah. I, what I would like to, I find it so fascinating to hear the full story from your perspective. We should get the arrow and Benny as well at some point. Oh, and, for sure. Uh, about the specific situation, because I remember it very vividly. I mean, I knew Benny and I were not playing our best round at, and we got smoked in the game one. It is left and right. You guys were doing everything right, and we were not doing anything. But I knew, okay, let's we'll just clean up the game, and we should take home game two, and then game three, 69. It was actually what preceded it, because I watched it. You, I think you were, someone was serving on me. You guys got a defensive touch, but we still managed to get the hold. Yeah, so I remember. Yeah. Instead, it was sixteen. It's not the hit. It would have been yeah. seventeen, eight, and or something. That is when, in my head, and this is for people listening, maybe a lesson. I was like sixteen, ten. But I was like, okay, I know these two. I know my opponents, and I know if I get into their hands, then we can still win this game because I there was not a single second of millisecond in my mind where I doubted Benny as a competitor on that field because I knew Benny had some crazy comebacks, not only against me, but against almost everyone. And if I started to push, then he would be on the road. So that's when I came to him, I was like, Benny, I'm going all in. So, okay. And after the game, he said he had no idea what I was do doing or like talking about. I was like, okay, whatever. And then I did the first speed move and full disclosure, I'm not a surf baller if I was. Probably I would have stayed in the game. <laughs> Way too difficult at some point. And I prioritize other things enough. But first, okay, ace. Second, you guys made a error. Third, 
eight. Okay, sixteen thirteen. Okay. You guys took a timeout. Uh, there was a break, sixteen or sixteen fourteen. You had a hold, sending for in. Then Benny got an ace or a point, yeah. and I already knew at that time. I was like, we're down, I think three or four points, and I told Benny, okay, we're gonna lose. And I was like, yeah, I think so. Even though being down, because we're so sure, okay, we are already in your hand. And we've done this before, many times in the past, when we had to clutch up, so to say. And then it went back and forth, then we were in the extras. And another point that I would like to point out to people was, Benny and I were struggling on service. I was just doing backs, backhands. I would double fold, but I would do backhand on the second serve. I would not care. I was like, it's all in, all the time. I don't care. I'll stick with the winning deck. And then I would go to Benny and I said, Benny, do a lefty. Benny had by no far wasn't like his lefty wasn't super deadly, but something he hasn't been doing on. And he was like, You think so? I was like, Yeah, let's do a lefty. He did a lefty, we got the touch, and we made a point. And he was like, Okay, good. And then four points later in the extras, actually the match point, I came to him again. I was like, Benny, let's do it again, the lefty. Like, okay, he did it. We got again defensive touch. I think it was a roll up and we won the game. Hmm. And the point being is that sometimes your partner is so focused, so in the tunnel that he doesn't see things that, okay, the receiver has been struggling with something that was left in this case. So it's very important as a communication of partners say, okay, no, I trust you, do this. Now, because then it takes away the decision, okay, my left is have not really been hitting. Or what should I do? But if your partner comes to you and tells you to do something, he fully believes in you. And you get this belief, at least I do, where, okay, I'm not going to let him down. I'm just going to hit it. And if I screw up, then I screw up. He said, he told me, so we are a team. I don't really care. Right? Which can be difficult when you are with different partners a lot because you don't know how people react to criticism or to this kind of pushing. Right? Because if I say it to other people, they may think, oh, he thinks my right is not good enough. Oh my God, maybe I should play it safe. I don't know. But this is what you need to know each other a little bit or know the type of players you are. So in our case, full disclosure, we should not have won that game. 100% not. We did not win that game. You guys lost it. And, and we, we all know. I mean, oh, we, all know. Know. we were so done. After that, I think we lost the finals 21-17 twice. I just couldn't move anymore. But <laughs> lessons learned. I fully believe in my partner, who's mentally great player, obviously former European champion. So he has to know something. It was for us a little fun time because we played final tournament together. But we knew, okay, once we do this, let's go and we'll have fun. And that's it. So for us, it was it was fun game. It was really a great way to start the year for me personally. So how did you bounce back? Because then you went to Berlin tournament. Yeah. Let me uh, get you up to speed with the 2023 yeah. season and how it went, because I think there are some great lessons to be learned uh, strictly from the mental side as a player and as a team. So we started the season with the off season. So uh, we have met in Warsaw. We trained a ton. We had a training week, just the two of us, when we did two trainings a day. We woke up at uh, five to go to the gym and train there. And then afterwards, uh, we trained uh, in the afternoon. And we put so much work and we had good progress. But this, uh, with this amount of uh, preparation, came a great amount of expectations. And then we went to Prague in Invitational. Invitational? Uh, Berlin. The, no, 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 not the, not the Berlin, but the, uh, Berlin was after. The December uh, oh, European Masters. Indoor Masters. European. Yeah, we, we went there. And we had huge expectations. We were there, okay, we're going there to win. And if we score anything below podium, it's a failure. And with that mentality, we screwed the, screwed up the group completely and got knocked out in the round of 16 by a great team of uh, uh, from Asaya 
and Felix Arnoldi. Uh, and I think these expectations forbid us to play our best. And then after that, it was honestly like an up and down and up and down because then we played Brno, where we played well. We had a game against you, which we lost. And then we lost in the third place. But honestly, it was a decent tournament. Uh, and then afterwards, a very interesting thing happened where we went to Berlin for the Berlin Invitational. 16 teams, best teams from all over Europe have been invited to play in the indoor tournament in Berlin. And we were extremely good team. So sorry, 16 very good teams. They were not the best. They were quite some... Very true, yes. yes. Very, very, very good team. Very, very good Very team. true. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but one of the teams, uh, Hustin Brothers, Kurkumbia, Paul play with uh, Jan Umlauf and uh, nice. obviously Fabi Yosha. And uh, yeah, we went there. We were feeling a little pressure because we haven't uh, played an invitational tournament till that point as a team. And it was the, I, I believe so for me, the worst tournament that I've ever played because we haven't won a single game. And from the playing perspective, it wasn't so bad, but from the mental side, I think back then, me personally, I haven't been equipped with the tools to deal with pressure and I wasn't able to play my best and perform my best. And in, in spite of the preparation that I did in the off season and I was still doing at that time, I wasn't able to reach my peak performance. So it was a huge blow for me because I I was preparing so much. And then Burden Invitational, we lose every game. We play like nine games. We lost every single one of them. And I was like, what am I doing with my life? Should I even be doing round that? I'm, I'm, I'm losing to the best teams in Europe, but I want to be the best. So I'm, I cannot win a single game. What's happening? And then... Uh, a, a, a funny story is that you reached out to us, uh, to me and Yaro, after Berlin Invitational, not just after, but uh, yeah, I think a week after, something like that. And you said, Yo, guys, do you want to be a part of future round the clubs as athletes, one of the best athletes in Europe? Or you didn't say, say it like this, but yeah, would you want, want to be a part of the club? And for me, that was such a huge thing because I, at that time, had a belief that I'm not good enough. And then somebody's reaching out to me, like you running a club consistent of international European players, best in Europe. You're like, do you want to be a part? I'm like, you appreciate me at my worst? That's a huge thing. And uh, honestly, thank you, man, because you, in a way, picked me from a pit I dug myself into because it was only in my head because I, again, mental thing, decided for that tournament to define me. I made that choice and then you you helped me get out of there. And uh, after that 2023 season, we went to Mallorca, which had both best European and uh, USA best teams uh, some of the best players from the US, Clark Marshall, Barry Hammond. And we had zero expectations because we lost every game the previous tournament. So we're like, let's just have fun and play our best. And had fun and play our best we did. We managed to uh, to play some third place on the podium and we had a great day. Uh, and honestly, afterwards, after a great win, came a great loss after a great, great loss came a great win. And it's, uh, it's very, uh, correlated with the expectations that we had, because when we place high, we knew that we have to keep that and it was too much. And then we scored low, for example, Vienna, uh, the last ETS before Padua, we finished last, it was 29 teams, I believe. Uh, in the pro bracket, we were the 29th team. And then afterwards, we managed to get a fourth place at Padua. 
So that's a very interesting and strange dynamic that I definitely want to work on this season, be more consistent. And uh, I've uh, equipped myself or I've uh, uh, seeked out a lot of knowledge and educated myself on the mental approach to be able to uh, deal with pressure and expectations and everything else. So that's a quick recap of the 2023 season. I think the biggest highlight, if I would have to name one, was playing Port Combien, round of 16, on their home soil, three setter, extras, third set, a crowd like it was a finals, and it was electric. It was it was crazy. And there are some, there are some great pictures from there. I remember not playing great. And you were the one cheering there for us, and there was like a huge crowd of French people, uh, because obviously for Gambian French champions, uh, and a, and a great team, and playing on their home soil, and but, we the underdogs trying to 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 break into the uh, but, quarters. But first of all, I mean, I mean, I still get I still get goosebumps when you say the. Berlin story that I kind of like picked you, picked, picked you up because I honestly, fully story, I didn't know. I did not know you were in such a mess. I knew that you didn't perform so well in Berlin and also in Brno back then. But like for me, I didn't care. I didn't care about the results of one or two tournaments. We had a Great conversation after Bruno. I still remember this in, in the in the pub, um, and it just just feels so great you know, to be able to know that I've touched you emotionally and that I've touched people because I'm not in it so I can run it for money. It, I was in a lot for like prestige and winning tournaments and placing very well. So I know more than. More enough about placing expectations and then not fulfilling them, then feeling really bad and all this stuff. But I think that could be a solo podcast for a couple of hours. Most definitely. I was, can we can maybe do part two? Like, okay, this tournament, what happened? Or this thing in life. Um, but what I saw in you and in Yaro already earlier is that you really want it, that you want to train. And this is something you cannot you cannot teach, because you you have this grind or grit. I think okay, you're gonna just like you're like good shark, like a, like a tiger shark. You're just gonna go and bite, and you're not gonna let go, right? So, and I knew also Yaro had it in him. It's a different type of player, different type of person, completely, uh, like personality wise, very different to me personally, of course. Uh, but this is something you cannot teach. And I knew that you guys are going to need your time and that the mental aspect is going to be the biggest challenge because I would, like, similar to Lucas Stopkin, I would never have to worry about if I were your coach, like one to one, that you are not going to put in the reps. Because I know if I tell you to do 20 serves, you're going to do 40. I tell you to do 10 hits, you're going to do 50. Right? So this is something that you, that you have in you. And that's why I'm not surprised that you guys finished fourth at Euros. I actually obviously was cheering. Uh, I think I was in, yeah, I was in a different country. That's why I wasn't there in Padua. I had to work. Uh, is that, okay, there was a chance for podium. And same at ETS Prague when you guys finished second. But it was the, the consistency that was lacking. And I actually recently learned something very new, or not new, and something very important about it. But before I reveal that, is how or what mental tools, and maybe let's get into specifics, have you learned or you have you worked with someone to equip you now to deal with these kind of situations or the expectations and failing them and being your worst enemy uh, so people can maybe also apply to their lives, not only in Brownet, but also in business or in personal lives? So what did yeah, you absolutely. Um, I... As I mentioned pre, uh, earlier on, I uh, had meetings once a week with the sport sci psychologist, uh, and I learned a, a great bunch, and and also been equipped with uh, tools to handle pressure, as I said. So, 
first of all, I think I would love to start when talking about the mental side of Roundnet to share my mindset that I go to a tournament with, which consists of two things. First is no expectations, right? Because from the from my and this is something that I've uh, uh, came up with, let's say, only recently. So this 23 season, I had expectations. And looking back at the 2023 20, season, analyzing it, knowing when I didn't have expectations, I were, was able to play my best. When I did, I wasn't. It was a easy pick for me. It's obviously different for a lot of people, but I, I just want to share what works for me. And I honestly didn't get my, that. I didn't came up with that at my own, but I listened to uh, that Roundup podcast when Ryder Rivadonera, one of the best players to ever play the game, uh, spoke on having no expectations. And I was so shocked, right? Imagine being considered one of the best, maybe even the best. And then he was at his peak back then as well. And he said he's going to a tournament with zero expectations because he's not training as much and that's why he don't have expectations and i'm like that's crazy you're the best you have no expectations and it really it really struck me and i think um that was that's what i uh was a huge takeaway from that uh what he said uh so having no expectations and the second thing would be having the ultimate confidence in your ability and the ability of your partner to win against every opponent that you're going to face. Obviously, if you're a beginner or in your intermediate going into the tournament, you know they're going to be a better team, but you uh, and you're maybe trying to go for, let's say, top 10, then you still have to have this ability of the fact that if you're going to play great, you can win with anyone. And uh, yeah, that's just my approach when I go into the tournament, which almost, con or it actually does contradict itself a little bit because on one hand, I have no expectations. On the other, I believe that I can win with against every, anybody. Uh, but I feel like this provides me with no expectations i can only do better because having no expectations everything i do is extra and then when it comes to pressured situations i know i can deliver so that would be my mindset for going into the tournament and but, one of the great tools that i have and how do you build up confidence um, with to have this mindset okay i can be that one how did you build up yeah uh it's it's simple hard work and preparation there's a great quote from a player uh that i cannot remember the name of uh but i believe it's a, a american football player he said he does not win games on sunday or saturday when they are played he wins them on monday tuesday thursday and friday when he trains right so this preparation that you do enables you to have this confidence in your ability and the confidence that you actually have put in the work and you did everything you could to play at your best. Because as Kobe Bryant said, results doesn't really matter. It's all about figuring it out. But you have to focus on what you can control. Can you control the result of the tournament? You cannot. You can impact it. But you don't. You cannot control the weather. You cannot control how your teammates gonna play, how the opponents gonna play. You can definitely control how much work are you putting in. So, just grind, and that gives you ultimate confidence. Yeah, and it was Michael Jordan who was a big advocate of having like very very hard practices, and he would push his teammates and coaches and everyone. So then you go to the game, and it's easy. Yeah, he said he doesn't compete with anybody. He competes with what, what he's capable of. And yeah. that's a great quote. Quote to live by, honestly. And absolutely, I know that 
this is something that a lot of people don't understand. Like, okay, practice should be hard. I mean, I learned to love the hard work. Yes, I always throw, like in my mind, for example, if I'm in the gym and doing a set of reps and then I set the goal, okay, I'll try to failure and everything. And then I cannot and I push and I tell myself this is exactly when people give up. This is what makes me different. And that's why I push. And of course, a lot of the, I mean, you always fail because the way with gravity, you can beat that easily or you can beat. But it's those extra, extra meters, right? I remember having a track and field coach and I would run 500 meter, 500 meter runs. I think I was, I don't know how old I was as younger. And it had to be under two minutes, which maybe for the track and field people, there is not a lot. But for me back then, it was quite challenging. I was not in a best shape. And he told me, it's the last meters that count. Like the first minute and 45 minutes, seconds doesn't, doesn't, doesn't matter. First one thing is when you can, that is when you actually train in the gym. That is where you destroy the most muscles. This is when you can actually grow. And I think it was in Mallorca, the Nelson's zero is the European champion 2022, um, mindset clinic or presentation where this question was asked and I raised my hand and said, yeah, I just prepare. I prepare harder than everyone else. I used to train 10 hours a week. I sacrifice everything. So if I get there on the field, I know I can be there. anyone. I don't really care. That is then the challenge with the partner because I've played with people who did not believe in winning the tournament or they are good enough or even in myself. Like they didn't believe in me. They didn't believe that I was so good. Right? Because maybe I was not such a strong server, but in the depth, I always truly believed that I was one of the best, especially every time I stepped foot on the court. I mean, during my high playing days, let's say 2022, 21, not really recently. And this is what why partners need to be on the on the same page. And yeah, very sure. maybe to demonstrate this point, like specifically in terms of Raumet. In 2021, I went to the US to play and train because I knew in order to get to the national team, German national team, I really have to be the best. I have to compete with the best. And Germany back then was not even playing with the no hit zone. I was like, okay, I need to go. Somehow I managed to score a week with Frederick Hinkle and Dawson Morgan, Michigan by randomly texting all the pro players who they were up to three, four weeks in, in the summer. And Fred invited me over. And shout out to Fred uh, and the tournaments there. And I set a goal for myself to become the very first European player who actually earned premier on the US soil. There's only one premier player before it, Tom Rogers, who got it because he was the British champion back in the day. And he also lived in the US, very good player, back there, or probably now as well. Um, and then we got it, we got second place. We got premiere. I was very happy. I was completely, utterly devastated because I had some health issues before that, things I picked up in Colombia before, and so on. And then I went to my first premiere tournament. And I was like, wow, these are the pros I've been watching online. Oh my God. It would be so great to win one game. And I played with Connor Proud, actually. And we won a match. We won a series. It was back then, a two day series. Um, I was like, wow, okay. But but there was another series that we should have won, but I did not believe in myself or in us that we could keep up, even though he was a premier player, but I was a fresh player, a fresh premier, and so on and so forth. And then the following tournament where was someone else, I also didn't do very well because like, oh, these Orca players, oh my God, premier, it's so cool. I'm not on their level. They don't make mistakes because I only had the highlight videos in my head. Right? And then you fast forward six months, I uh, won a bunch of tournaments in between in Europe. And I went there again with Yaro, your partner, you know, and Dominic from Spike Rabbits. They won contender in Richmond from 70 teams and qualified for Premier, something that's never been done before as well. And I played Richmond tournament. And I told myself, with my partner, Trevor Clemens back then, like, okay, we can win every game. Like there is no one that can beat us. If we lose to a national team player or a pro player, 
I'm fine with it, but let's give them a hard time. And I was like, I like it. In our group, um, we had Kingdom Come mm -hmm. uh, and Finocchi Model were the top two seats. That was before Power Pools. I was, I think, a, six, a lot of pro, a lot of premium teams, over 30, I believe, back then. Right. That's when Ravi and Ryan was actually one. Um, and we beat everyone in our pool, and then we played Max and Gabe, who was like 21 16, and Kingdom Come. I played Grand Playbook before in pickup, also a funny story. Um, and we lost 21 18, I think, or 21 17 to Kingdom That's Come. Good. Yeah. I was like, okay. I mean, they were up, then they slowed down a little bit. We caught up, but they were clearly the better team. And I thought, Trevor, uh, Trevor, we need to requalify for Premier, that's for sure. So we need a bracket and let's see, like, first game and let's see who we get in round of 16. And we would meet again, Finoki Model. <laughs> Back then, because I was like, freak, I'll group, I want to play someone else, but okay, whatever. And I told them, I thought, Trevor, like, I think we can take them to game three. Let's make it our goal to take them in three games. Because we should not be able to do that, skill-wise. I was like, I like it. Trevor, great server, very um, player with a finesse. Young fella, though. So not a lot of experience in this regard. And I was like, yeah, I don't have a partner for a tournament in two weeks, so I need to sell myself well. You know, so I can say, say OK, I took Finoki and Model with my team to three games. And we played and we lost the first game, I think, 21 16. We won the second game, 21 17. No way. Trevor did like, I think, three, four aces. It's all also online, so I can't make, be making this up. We're receiving, we're there at every ball. Like, I was like, we're not losing, we go. And they made yeah. a couple of mistakes because they probably thought, okay, I'm too easy. We beat them easily in the first game. Yeah. And then game three, I think, till 14, 13, it was still. Was still the same, but then some aces and uh, we ended up losing 21 16. I don't know. Um, they really kicked up the higher gear, but yeah. I saw in myself this huge difference in mindset compared to the first turn. I was, I'm so happy to be here to be part of it. Maybe let's win a game compared to I want to beat everyone. And if I play a pro player, pro players, I just want to give them run for their money, make them try out. That's mm -hmm. all. And, and have fun. And it worked. So this is really like what works for me. Okay, I don't want to lose the game or the tournament before. And this is where a coach comes in that he needs to give his players, in my view, the confidence. Okay, you work hard, you got this. If the result doesn't really matter, let's improve. So this was, this was for me. I was story about playing a lot in the US or a bunch of tournaments in the highest divisionals. Okay. I'm here and I belong. Because I didn't think I belong in 2021. In 2022, I was sure I belong there. How was it for you? Have you also struggled with Yareba? Like, do we belong here to be at the top? Did you have some doubts? Or were you like, okay, we prepare so much, like we certainly belong there? Mm, honestly, our first encounter with uh, the cream of the crop of Europe was Berlin. And we definitely felt the pressure uh of being among uh only great teams uh since it was an invitation tournament and then afterwards we i think we adjusted well playing in mallorca uh it wasn't power post but it was a close division of the best teams and yeah we had a group uh lucas eisentrager who play with uh, dohyon uh and uh, other great teams that we met that tournament we just did not care who we were playing against we just focused on playing our game uh, you did lose i think only i'm <laughs> sorry in the semis and for the people listening mallorca was actually the very first gold division ever in europe we had 16 gold teams so in, everyone was premier qualified so for those folks who did not play in Berlin, there was also a first time kind of experience. You need to play your best from the start because in 2022, it was not the case. And then we also in Europe set out to do the gold division now called pro division. So you have the, you have better games right from the start. And you only lost in the semis against Ravi Kandl and Buddy Hammond and I believe in three games, right? We took them to three indeed. 
Exactly. And that is something I, like what you can build up on, right? I mean, you beat me and Frederick Hinkle, one of the best players in the world, uh, for sure. Um, in game, like third place game, we also had a very tough semis. Also game three against Clark Marshall and Coba Florida. Well, also, I would also love to see that game. Yeah, also a team you could definitely lose against, right? But we both knew with Fred, okay, we'd have to play really well to beat them. And I'm here also tired from running the entire week and preparing everything. I felt it. And it was the very first time actually again the game against you in the third place where I felt that I didn't belong there. And I knew this is when like the kind of retirement things of thoughts started saying, like, I have not trained, I don't belong here. And then my body simply collapsed, like mental and everything. They you also know, injured my ankle, but then kept playing. Poor Fred, you know, I had to put up with that because I could not say that I could not do anything. I like completely collapsed. Like yeah. my mind would just like shut out. If you remember that, I was like, I, I don't remember. I was out of air. But you guys beat us fair and square, and you only lost to the winners of the tournament, which was arguably one of the, not to tooth my own heart, but one of the best tournaments in terms of people like players when you get one to three four top americans like the world champions clark and buddy you know different teams Frederick and ravi kandulas also still knows how to play right uh run the og and then you build up on that you went to paris you had a great series against paul combiar prague you did very well and then there was this dip again right in summer you did not play well yara played with big contra yeah, it was Stockholm, London, and Vienna, I believe. Yeah. So what I wanted to add, and then we'll move on to the future projection, we'll also look at the time to wrap it up soon, is with the dip that you guys had from Stockholm till Vienna, yeah? I think you yeah. can say that there was a dip. You didn't play that well. And... Yeah, in London, we didn't play together, but in Stockholm and Vienna, we didn't perform. Yeah, but the Stockholm also didn't go very well. Yes. Yeah. So I was talking, it was also very random, to one handball coach who was a former national coach of Slovak handball women's, so friend of my father or my family, who went on an event together. And he's now coaching a second league team, so not the highest league anymore, um, because it's also very difficult. So, okay. But I asked him, okay, like, what is your secret? What are the lessons learned? You've been coaching handball for 40 years. You played in the Slovak national team on the height of like Slovak handball, so to say. So it was very difficult to be a national player in the 90s. And he said, as a coach, you need to plan and be aware that certain situations are coming and prepare your players. And what he talked the most was struck most the dip. So he said, during every season, your team is going to experience a dip. You try as hard as you can, you do everything in training session, but you just cannot win and you cannot play well. And I was like, wait a minute, I mean, that sounds familiar. Right? And he said, I was like, what do you do? So, okay, first you need to make your players aware that at some point it's coming, that it's part of the journey, and then not really think a lot about it, just keep showing to the gym, showing to the, gym to the training sessions, and do what you're supposed to do. And really be free in your head because you know it's coming. And I was like, that is actually such a great advice. Because if you think about it in terms of like anecdote, would be that let's say you're right, you're going to anywhere riding a car, and suddenly half an hour traffic jam or one hour traffic jam. So like, oh come on, what's happened? And you can get a little bit annoyed. Compared to the fact when you know that you're taking this route and there's going to be a traffic jam because there's construction. So we already plan with, okay, one hour extra, maybe even two. So you can prepare a podcast or, you know, like you're prepared mentally. And I think I've read this also in one of the business books that I read. And I was like, okay, if you take that to sports or actually in life, you need to just believe, okay, this is the phase, it's going to come and it's just going to pass. If you keep doing the work, you just can't give up. Or a lot of people do give up, right? So maybe this was also the pit for you in 2023 during this time. And it can be one tournament, it can be one week, it can be two months, right? World of sports is known for 
of people not performing well in the preseason or season, and then playoffs come and bam, they play like from fairy tale. Yeah. Yeah, I believe that uh, Stockholm, uh, London, Vienna was a dip for us. And I think what you just said is uh, a very valuable thing for people to take away. That uh that numbers it's it's okay so whenever i actually had this very funny thing that i had the training on my birthday last year uh and it was a terrible terrible training it was one of those i just i just couldn't perform and i was i just smiled uh and thought so good that i know that it's part of the process because if i didn't i would be like come on, it's my birthday, I have a terrible training, what the hell. But if you know, if you prepare yourself, that it's not going to be uh, roses and flowers along the way, all the way, but actually hard work and dips and highs and lows, it's, uh, it's easier to, uh, to, to, to be able to react to that sort of situation. It is though sometimes it can be quite difficult because you lose or you can lose the sense or your vision a little bit for a while there. And I feel I know for me personally, now with traveling a lot in the recent couple of months, but like changing jobs, working abroad and so, so forth. If you don't have accountability buddy or someone to train with and like hold yourself accountable and support each other in these terms or in these times, it can get very frustrating and you can start and the doubts are going to crawl in and i have one very specific project in mind but before i i reveal it i i just must be i always think when you said it's worth that of course but one of my greatest role models i'm not schwarzenegger they asked him and i think in the 70s i don't know everyone when they're lifting weights they're like grunting and they are not smiling and you are smiling all the time you talk to everyone and your body you cannot stand on your legs but you don't care you pro whatever why and he said you know it's simple every time i lift a weight doesn't matter if it's five kilos or 300 i know i'm getting better and i'm getting closer to my vision which is to be the best bodybuilder of all times and become mr olympia so he reframed this in his mind that everything he does in the gym and also outside is going to bring him closer. Even though if he didn't feel like waking up early in the morning and working out for five hours a day and starting his own business, like both like I think construction business and the mail order business, and then he got into real estate and all the other stuff, fascinating for character. But once you remind yourself, and sometimes it's useful to do it on a daily basis, I do it with journaling or manifestation, right, then it's okay in this part of the process to have days where you just don't feel like it. Okay, you yeah. go and do it. You feel a little bit better afterwards, but it just, it's not your day. It's really what I tell myself is exactly those days that count. It doesn't work out every, every time, of course, but I get ahead of the curve compared okay. to failures or everyone. So I, I, I love the fact that it would be like splitting uh, or like sharing a little bit of sports clo uh, cl quotes, not quotes, quotes, because I find it's lacking nowadays that people don't really have role models 
and they don't follow people for the right reasons. I mean, as growing up athletes, we always had someone that we wanted to aspire. Like also in my, on my, in my, in my twenties, you know, the, the crown and so on and so forth. But yeah, I, I just love that. So, so what are your big plans for 2024 in order to wrap up slowly? Our 2024 big plans. Uh, Mallorca coming up. Uh, I've said it before and I say it again. It's my favorite. And if I had to pick one event of the season, it would be Mallorca. If I had to choose, I would just go to Mallorca for two weeks, train the first, do a ton of pickup and hang out with friends in the second week. I'm looking forward to that and I cannot wait. Playing with Yaro the whole season. Uh, obviously, Barcelona, ETS is potentially uh, some German masters. I'd love to mesh up with some players. Uh, love to repeat the tournament with Asaya, play with Yosha, uh, Vandala, uh, Levy. Honestly, the list goes on and on. Uh, and uh, yeah, I believe that one of the plans that are I would usually maybe not sure is not only the tournaments and where do I want to go, but uh, the grind. And I would, I just want to, uh, no matter how I perform in a tournament, if I do bad or I do good, I want to keep up with the grind because as you mentioned, role models, my, one of my role models is Kobe Bryant and he his work work ethic always was something that impressed me uh, immensely and I just want to focus on what what I can control I can control getting better every single day and if I can do that I'm happy if the result don't come or if they do don't really care as soon as I'm like focused on what I can control those are some really really cool cool goals but how did you do it in the past i mean now compared to now because now you have yaro and you have your groups in warsaw your advanced groups but before that maybe for players who want to become better but really don't know how because maybe in their community there is not another premier player or a, even a contender player or people don't have the mindset to improve what can this person do or what did you do um, back in the day so they could improve because there are still no really resources that much for an individual right. person. Right. Uh, back in the day, it was very funny because it was trial and error. Uh, so I still see some bad habits as because I was playing for, I'm, I'm playing for over six years. So I, I just, some bad habits still stick with me because I had to try everything for myself. And I think nowadays we are more and more uh, blessed with the opportunity to have the knowledge given to us by somebody more experienced. And there's still not that much coaching content, uh, but you can always reach out to better players. And a uh, quick story uh, that uh, proves that argument, proves that point, is that my friend from Warsaw, Mikolai, reached out to Matt Cole after Matt Cole had won uh, and became the the champion of the world tour and uh, Kingdom Come shocked everybody. And uh, you would think that right now he's unattainable, right? He, he gets 10,000 messages a day. He doesn't respond. But Mikol, I asked, like, message him on Instagram, and Matko replied, and it wasn't just a, like a "Hi, Mickey, what's up?" blah blah, blah reply. He like went in depth uh, into the answer of the question about training, about getting better, and that's something that really, like, shout out to Matko. That's 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 awesome. Uh, but also, uh, for for those of you listening, always remember that you can reach out to 
anybody on Instagram and uh, anywhere and just ask advice and try to uh, pick their mind on uh, how they get better around it. So that would be my advice. Search for content, watch game footage, and just seek advice from better players. Again, Kobe always did that. He went to every best player in the league and tried to get the most knowledge out of them as possible. Yeah, that, that is a great story, and I only can confirm that Kobe is a great human being. He actually hosted me here in Dominic in Denver in 2022. Uh, we had a we had a great time. It's a great human. So shout out to Metco. I also played him and Ryan Gross in one of the tour tour series yet in Dallas. Um, but yeah, I mean, you need to reach out. But if you are not one of the persons, like you know, okay, I'm gonna reach out to Tiramisu or whatever. What is the worst thing that can happen if you send someone a text message? They're not going to reply. Yeah. Okay. That's it. You haven't lost your face. No one really knows. And the chances that they are going to get a great answer, and I got such great answers in the past uh, from multiple players, are rather high. I mean, they appreciate it. I mean, it's so nice when someone asks me also at this stage, like, okay, how do you do this? Or what would you recommend? This is also one of the reasons why I started this podcast with our future round and group, so to say, because there's so much knowledge that I have in my head that I want to share. And if people keep asking and the questions keep coming, I can just point them, okay, listen, listen to this to get more in depth. This is the short answer, but if you want to really know my thoughts or thoughts from Nelson or I, listen to this episode. And then you can really understand more and then ask questions, maybe questions that we haven't answered yet. So, I mean, the worst thing that can happen if you reach out to, to us, I mean, we definitely reply. It's, yeah, you don't get a reply and that's it. We are there to grow the sport together, eventually, hopefully making some money along the way so we can finance the trips, the tournaments, because that stuff isn't cheap. And guys, me and Anik, we've been working in secret, a semi-secret, on something really great and we will unveil it very soon so i think they do you think they should stay tuned especially oh, for sure. yeah. uh, we want to improve a lot and have it easy to improve as long as they do the hard work absolutely yeah most most, most definitely and my last question for you they if imagine you are a google expert and you can put an ad, so let's say a wallpaper, so everyone in the world, the majority of people in the world would see it. And you can do one for Rownet and also one for all the humanity. It can be a quote, it can be something you've learned. What would you, what would you share? Wow, that's a, that's a great question, man. One quote that I want to leave you and the listeners with huh got me thinking now take your time we have time we have time so many great great quotes out there man maybe something that you live by and worked out quite well for you I mean, yeah something like be nice uh, okay i'll i'll do two i'll do two uh one for round it and especially for those who want to get better, who want to be great. Uh, of the, the quote that we already mentioned earlier from Michael Jordan, I don't compete with other people. I compete with what I'm cap capable of. And I think that's such a great approach because then you strive to be better every single day. And that's just way to go. And Another thing that just came to mind, and I also try to leave by this quote, which might surprise you a little bit, listen, listeners too. But you said one for humanity. So that's a more general one, uh, which is from Shakespeare. There's not such thing as good or bad, but thinking makes it so. 
And I think it's a, such a great approach and it's such an interesting perspective that we label things or we react and we already have this label in mind. But honestly, every, every situation uh, is something that can have a, a great takeaway, a great lesson. And you just have to decide how you take it, because obviously some things can be great, some things can, can be really bad, but this is only how you how you choose to view them, you know, and I would love to get elaborate on that, but I feel like that's a topic for a whole entire episode and another conversation. So, yeah. So there is no such thing as good and bad. It's what thinking makes up out of it. But, but thinking makes it so, yes, exactly. Thinking. So honestly, Thank it translates to simpler words that you choose how to uh, view things. Mm -hmm. Right. I think that, 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 is, that is absolutely amazing finish. I could not have scripted it better, even if I did. <laughs> <laughs> or we of course um man thank you thank you so much for being here i'm looking forward to part two and to hang out in person very soon in beautiful spanish island it's where we'll see each other first oh yes hopefully very good weather so man where can people find you and follow you and yara for example you're on a journey instead of all the obvious channels as you yeah know. so uh our instagram is never called underscore roundnet and uh, if you want to follow our journey in the 2024 season uh give us a follow and and yara will be providing you, you with some top-notch memes as well as a, as a as a huge bonus i live for the memes that yara does and shout out to lou here which I think has the best meme game in the whole round that community. So shout out. Round in yours. Janek, Genki, as they would say in Polish. Thank you. And yeah, thanks. Thanks for having me, Jakub. It was uh, honestly a very nice conversation. I had a great time and I would love to do it again. And we'll do it. We have plenty of things to talk about. So it's good fun. So guys, again, thank you so much for listening and watching and everything and we'll talk to you soon attacker ciao ciao future round net